So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is Women in GIS February Lightning Talk Series. Um, we do a new topic every single month. Uh, for this month, it is geospatial big data. Um, my name is Madison Bradford. I'm a data scientist for the town of Gilbert and also your host today from the Women in GIS Professional Development Committee. Now, for these lightning talks, um, they're brought to you by the Professional Development Committee, and they're also open to everyone. So you do not have to be a member of Women in GIS. You do not even have to be a woman. Um, you can talk about geospatial related topics, uh, and you can, you know, you can present every month if you want to. So we're really happy that we have a lot of great speakers with us today. Uh, and we're really excited that um, everyone came to see these lightning talks. So we could not do what we are doing without the help of our sponsors. Uh, here are our platinum sponsors. Uh, we have Esri, Bad Elf, uh, Bad Elf, and Embedded Alliance. Uh, we have a whole bunch of other sponsors as well, and every single one is absolutely vital to what we do here. Our newest sponsor is actually DRT Strategies. Um, so we really welcome them to the group and we really appreciate all of their continued support. Today's presenters, we have a great lineup. We have two in person and one video. Uh, our first presenter will be Hambrel Joe and Emma Passer. Uh, sorry, Emma Paz. Uh, and they'll be talking about Lombard and Geopar what? Hopefully the what is what you were going for there. Uh, our next presenter will be Jaya Sipulsan Nair. Um, she will be talking about the analysis of large scale airborne LIDAR point clouds. And then our final presenter will be Rachel Passer. And Rachel will be telling us a little bit about establishing workflows with big geospatial data. Uh, so before our first presenter, I'm just going to give a little bit of a bio. So for Hambrel Joe and Emma Paz, I'm going to do your bios together before you present. Uh, Hambrel Joe is a software engineer at Company A, specializing in mapping and cities. Emma is an application developer at Development Seed. She is passionate about geography, data, and code, and seeks to build valuable map-centric tools that bring compelling data and visualizations to everyone, decision makers, and the greater public. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that uh, our first presenter, Hamble Joe, and Emma Paz can begin. All right, thanks, Madison. And Honestly, I don't know that I could have pronounced that any better. Uh, so well done on um, on uh, introducing our our talk. Uh, and it's been a while since I've been on Zoom. Uh, so let me just figure out what I want to share here. I, think I get it. I have a great screen. I understand. <laughs> uh, yeah. OK. Hopefully no one got too dizzy just then. All right. And um, yeah, you know, I, I think I'll just uh, keep it like, well, no, let's go into slideshow mode. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for having us. Um, both Henbilo and I are uh, are excited to give this talk. Uh, and uh, probably full disclosure is that <laughs> We're we're just getting on board with uh, GeoPark A um, because we've we've been onboarding to to contribute to this project um, that is close to the heart of development seed and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, Hanbil and I both come from, uh, you know, a visualization data visualization backgrounds, and so. And I hope that a lot of people here do too. Uh, and so we want to talk about um, the traditional way uh, or a traditional uh, path for visualizing data on the web um, and how, uh, yeah, it's pronounced Geoparque, how we can simplify and derive a lot of benefits from Geoparque uh, in both uh, JavaScript for web mapping and Python environments for uh, data science, right? Uh, Jupyter Lab Notebook. In the, among the scientific community. Uh, and we would be remiss not to uh, not to disclose you know, what limitations exist, especially given that GeoPark A is relatively new uh, as an OGC standard. Um, but that's kind of where we're headed today. Hope um, hope everyone's dialed in. Um, we're yeah, let's let's take it away, Hanvio. 
Yes, thank you, Emma. Yeah, as Emma said, we both develop geospatial applications, like a lot of them are for like scientists. So we have to visualize the geospatial data for web very often. Next slide. Unless the data is like small, the data often has to be handled in separate ways for analysis and web. There will be one data for Jupyter Lab. There will be another data for like a web visualization. For analysis, like the data size can be a bit less restrictive, even though the visualization of it can take quite a long time. I think if you have experience of like, like writing GPD that plot or something, you know how long it can take if your data is big. But web application is uh, quite sensitive to the size. Files that have many geospatial shapes and feature can easily result in a big data that can be difficult to be handled in a browser. So tiling has been a, one of the strategies for the geospatial data for web for a while. Tiling splits the data into different squares depending on the zoom level. So the rendering engine that understands the protocol of this square can load only the necessary portion of the data in the browser. So I recently went through this workflow with Seoul building data sets, which like the original data was in shape file format around 500 megabytes, which became 300 megabytes after cleaning up in GeoJSON. And of course it was like too big to be loaded in the web browser. So I tiled it like as I needed. Next slide. But we are experimenting the new workflow that could have been possible with the GeoParky. So Emma will talk details about GeoParky later. So right now, I just want to say Apache Parky is a powerful column-oriented data format built as a modern alternative to CSV file and GeoParky, like just special version of it. And GeoParky can make the data quite compact. Like for example, the same whole building data that has six million buildings in it became twenty-seven megabytes in GeoParky format. And with GeoParky, analysis and web visualization, like a Jupyter Lab and web browser, can use the same format. It does not have to have a separate data formats. So one Parky can be used for both Jupyter Lab and web. In development seat, there is an active development going on for rendering GeoParky in both platform, like Jupyter Lab, like called Longboard, and the browser DeckGL layer, which you can actually try today. And some might concern that like 27 megabytes, it seems so still a bit too big to render on web directly. And it is a valid concern, especially if your users are not expecting the size of the, this data. However, for loading and rendering the data, thanks to the power of a web worker and WebGL, through DeckGL, the power, the browser can render this amount of data without much lags. And I'm yeah. testing this to Emma. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, so uh, just to go back, um, that's a pretty significant file size reduction. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not an expert, um, but uh, the the high level details of of GeoParquet building on Apache Parquet are that we're talking about really a really super efficient data format. It's a new data format. Um, and, and that's where we get that file size reduction. Uh, and so Hanbyo mentioned it. What's key about it is that it, it is columnar based um, and it's it's by chunks, but the premise is that for analysis, right? Uh, a lot of analysis is done in a single column as opposed to um, different different columns in a row where different columns are going to have different uh, data types. And so the efficiency comes in that um, by grouping columns, right? Uh, now you're now you can run analysis across giant chunks of columns uh, more quickly. And then building on that too is uh, the notion that, uh, as we'll mention in one of our slides, um, with Apache Arrow, we can also leverage saving to binary. Um, and binary can sound really scary <laughs> uh, because you know there's a reason we don't write binary, right? That's computer speak. And so for 
for decades now, we've been writing languages that abstract away binary. Um, but if we're going to render data on a computer, <laughs> Uh, it's it's efficient, right, to save it as binary because that's what the computer is going to understand. Um, and so the 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 less steps that we can take um, to for for a computer to understand what it is that we're trying to render, um, then the more efficient, right? That's where that's where we're building in that speed. Um, so Apache Parquet, uh, widely adopted format. Um, it is not a geo format, but that's the basis of geo parquet. Uh, and over time, uh, you know, there have been a lot of technologies, a lot of uh, frameworks that are are built are are writing to and from uh, Apache parquet, uh, and and that's because you know data has been slung around in different environments, and so uh, all these libraries have come about. Uh, and so one way of uh, communicating back and forth from binaries to write these all of these different uh, uh, transforming libraries. Uh, but another way uh, is to um, to come to uh, agree on a on one format and that is called GeoArrow. Uh, so when we talk about the efficiency of, of the demo that I'll show, uh, we're saving to a GeoParquet uh, data format, but it's also um, it's saved in binary. And then behind the scenes, again, uh, we're using we're using some new technology in the browser. Um, WASM, right, WebAssembly, uh, that is allowing us to translate that binary to uh, the visualizations that uh, that we can see. Um, and then just some highlights on here. Uh, GeoParquet is a readable format, right? So this isn't a format in which you're we're talking about editing data. Uh, but when you're talking about big data, what do you want to do with big data? <laughs> you want to see it, right? So uh, that's that's really the the premise of um, of what we're trying to show. So uh, if we're promising you uh, simpler, faster rendering, um, I think, uh, Hanbiel, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think uh, the, like, we just wanted to show, like, this file can be used both for analysis and web, and then now, like, we can actually demo. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to swing over here to this demo that I have prepared. Uh, and this is, this is a huge uh, file. This is building uh, footprints in the Utah area. And this is a million building footprints and I can reload. Uh, and you'll see that it'll take, uh, you know, a little, little bit if I load my developer tools just to nerd out here. I think I did it too late. Uh, I just want to show that we're loading 47 megabytes, which is still a lot of data. Um, and then once we've loaded it, though, uh, just zooming in very quickly, we can see that uh, there's there's no response time. There's no lag in response time, right? Once I have the data, I have it. Uh, I haven't had to tile separately. Uh, if this data had attributes, I could click on my building footprints uh, and get those attributes very quickly. Um, or I could hit another API and get attributes for, for this data, right? So uh, the, this is a million footprints. Uh, and that's, uh, without tiling, that's pretty pretty crazy. So that's uh, GeoParquet on the web. Uh, and because we've mentioned Longboard and uh, and the need for visualization in notebooks in the world of data science, right? Uh, let's go back to, we just have a video demo. This is courtesy uh, of uh, Kyle Barron. He's, our, he's a developer with us. Um, and yeah, so similarly, uh, we can load a file uh, into Longboard. Uh, this is, I forget how many millions of points, um, but it's similar technology. Longboard is a Python library, uh, and it also leverages the DeckGL capabilities for rendering, uh, rendering data on a map. All right, so onward to limitations. Yeah, I think so far we have seen talking about how mighty the GeoParquet is, but it of course comes with some limitations. And first, like data 
transformation can be a little bit cumbersome. It uh, yeah, like whatever tools that you're using, maybe not supporting uh, like GeoParky export. And I sometimes have to often like try the different things to like make the GeoParky actually work in the end. And the second part is the web browser size limit. The how much data it can be loaded and render is subject to like browsers capacity, like number of the web worker that it can run. And the third one, it is not like a SQL database. So like if you need to like edit the data and allow the users to edit the metadata kind of thing, it's not really for that purpose. It is mainly for like a reading. And lastly, it is still pretty new. Uh, it's new data format, so all the tools and ecosystems around it are still pretty in active development, but also at the same time, which it is like exciting, like you can try out and you can contribute to it today. So next slide, in case you want to try the Jira kit today, like we, <laughs> like we, we attach this Jira command that you can convert the GeoJSON to the Jira and also I attached some pointers for like all the tools that you need to try the GeoParky, DeckGL, Longboard, all the ecosystems around it. And yeah, this is our presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I know there's a lot of new technologies in there and I bet we'll have a lot of questions for after. So at the end, after everyone is presented, uh, you know, as questions come in the chat, we'll save them all for the end. Uh, thank you so much. It's really cool to see stuff about WebJS because I do hear uh, a lot of browser, browser based um, products are the future. So thank you so much for sharing. Our next presenter is actually a video presenter. Uh, we have Dr. Jaya Srivastan Nair. Um, Jaya is a faculty member at IIT Bangalore, her research interests include visual analytics, data science workflows, and human computer interaction for spatial, temporal, and count data. She works with data sets in image, point cloud, network, matrix format, especially with applications ranging from LIDAR point cloud analysis and hazard susceptibility mapping to population healthcare survey analysis. If y'all can't hear sound, you have to let me know. Okay. Can't hear sound. You can't have to check sound. the box when you share. Before check you share. Box. Oh. When you go to share, stop mm -hmm. sharing and when the box comes up, there's a little there's a little box that says share sound. Oh, okay. Got it. There it is. Thank you so much, Jamie. Welcome. Okay. Thanks for bearing with me. We love Zoom. Hello, all. Today I would like to talk about divide and conquer for geospatial big data analytics. I'm Jaya Shri Alsan Nair. I'm an associate professor at IIIT Bangalore, India, and I'm affiliated to the Graphic Specialization Computing Lab and the eHealth Research Center. I begin. So let's discuss what big data is and what big data analytics is. Uh, big data is essentially defined by five Vs, and we are particularly interested in the volume. The uh, volume also implies large scale data sets. Now, why is big data analytics important? We need big data analytics to make sense of the big data. Now, the analytics are of different types. We start with descriptive analytics usually, where we look at what the data is about, then we move on to diagnostic analytics, where we look at why certain patterns exist in the data. Then we move on to predictive analytics, where we can predict something in future in terms of time. And then we move on to over and above all of these, which is called as a prescriptive analytics, where we look at all aspects of uh, the data. Now let's understand what geospatial big data is. Geospatial big data is essentially big data in the geospatial domain. 
So it has characteristics of both space and time most often. Now, if you look at the Gartner uh, hype cycle, in 2012, we see that geographic information systems for mapping, visualization, and analytics was in the peak of inflated expectations. So in terms of geospatial big data analytics, we see that it is an important technology that was waiting to grow in 2012. And what do we see in 2019? We see that geospatial and location intelligence is being used to optimize government collaboration and decision making. So obviously this domain and this area of research has become a very important aspect of everyday happening in the world. Now we look at the kind of problems that are solved using geospatial big data analytics here. There are seven major problems, which are sustainable development and climate change, clean water, population resources, health, peace and conflict, organized crime and energy, which were the problems in 2012 and continue to be the same even today. Now, why is this of interest to us? We tackle a problem uh, of semantic classification of airborne LIDAR point clouds. Now, before we move on to saying what airborne LIDAR is, let's just take a look at what the data here is. It's a set of 3D points, three-dimensional points of a very large geographical region. Here we are seeing the city of Surrey in Canada, which is described using more than 55 million three-dimensional points with very high point density of 20 ppm. Now this data set is divided into 40 tiles and this is done for semantic classification uh, uh, process. Now we see that this data set has around eight semantic classes, which include ground, vegetation, power lines, poles, etc. Right. Now, what is airborne LIDAR? Airborne LIDAR is a remote sensing technique where a low-flying aircraft emits pulses in the near-infrared near, red, near infrared, uh, spectrum for terrestrial applications and uh, um, green light for bathymetric applications. And the amount of time that it takes and the intensity with which it, re uh, uh, it returns to the receiver in the sensor, we understand the the distance of the point from the uh, sensor as well as the material that uh, uh, it has. Uh, so these are important uh, information for us to regenerate or reconstruct the 3D space. Now we see that if we look at the raw data, we don't get a good sense of what the data is. So when we apply semantic classification to it and color the points based on its classes, we, are, we begin to see buildings and trees and uh, so on and so forth, right? So um, how do we do the semantic classification? An important step for doing semantic classification using traditional machine learning algorithms is to do feature engineering. Now, how do we do feature engineering? We take each point, compute its local neighborhood using any shape. Here we see the cylindrical shape. We then compute something called as a 3D covariance matrix between each point and each of its neighbor, and then sum up all these matrices for all, for all the neighbors for the point and come up with a single matrix for a point. Then for every point, we compute several features, around 21 features, which includes several eigenvalue-based features, which come from the eigenvalue decomposition of this covariance matrix. Now, uh, doing this for a single local neighborhood is not sufficient because there's a lot of uncertainty in uh, the data sets that we are dealing with. So to combat that, we do uh, this local neighborhood analysis for multiple uh, spatial scales, and then find an optimal scale using Shannon entropy, et cetera. Now, what we see is that there is, uh, while the number of points may be uh, usable in a certain system, 55 million points is not a big deal. But we see that the processing of these points is at a cubic complexity. So our solution to this is to uh, rely on uh, big data framework, popularly used big data framework like Apache Spark, Cassandra, uh, integrated framework. Now the stages that you see for uh, doing both uh, uh, the semantic classification as well as uh, uh, progressive rendering of the 
classification of the points, what we essentially see is that this is not very different from how we deal with any other big data uh, problem. Not It's not uh, uh, very different for geospatial big data. The difference comes in where how we do the partitioning of the uh, point cloud to distribute it across the different nodes in the Spark Cassandra framework. Now, uh, how did we do this? We did a very simplistic thing. We did a grid-based uh, partitioning. Uh, and for every spatial partition, it is not guaranteed that all of its neighbors will be in the partition. So we created buffer regions. And uh, the non-buffer region is essentially what gets uh, uh, used for feature engineering. But we use the buffer regions to make sure that all the neighbors are uh, included in that particular spatial partition. And then we continue to do what we mentioned for local neighborhood search. Now, this is our divide and conquer strategy, which is quite simplistic. Now, let's take a look at another problem statement where we are trying to compute the flood susceptibility map of a particular region. So, this is done traditionally using machine learning algorithm where uh, the driving factors or the influencing factors along with the historical uh, flooding versus non-flooding sites are uh, put into a artificial neural network or a traditional machine learning algorithm. And we compute for every pixel um, if there is flooding or not, or what is the susceptibility for the flooding. Now, what we see is that because we want to use high resolution maps to gain um, highest precision, uh, we are unable to load such large data sets like the state of uh, uh, the one of the smallest states in India. Uh, we cannot uh, load the whole thing in a uh, in a single compute node. So what we end up doing is we essentially take the entire state, we partition it completely uh, using a lattice or grid structure, and then we uh, do a parallel processing of each of these nodes, where we essentially use a data parallelizing. Uh, algorithm. Now, data parallelism is not the only way to parallelize for machine learning applications. We can see that it is done using several uh, paradigms. Either the model weights can be split across cores or the data itself can be split across uh, nodes. Now, what we see here essentially is that for geospatial big data problems, uh, big data analytics problems, we need to uh, harness appropriate spatial partitioning to be able to do parallelization. Now, I would like to conclude this lightning talk by saying that spatial partitioning is a critical step when it uh, comes to dealing with problem sizes in uh, geospatial big data analytics. Now, why is it of interest even today? This is an age old solution. It has been around for a few decades now. Uh, but the the crux uh, of the uh, of the solution lies in the appropriate spatial partitioning algorithm that you can use. One is to suit the problem, and the second one is to balance the load across different nodes. So with that, I would like to conclude today's talk. I would like to acknowledge that all of this work has been done through master's thesis by Satendra and Bina, and an ongoing one by Ashwati. And uh, for this work, we have gotten generous funding from IIIT Bangalore, as well as Government of India through its several schemes. So thank you all. I'll be very happy to take questions at this juncture. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jaya. Uh, that was extremely interesting. I'm really glad you shared your uh, divide and conquer technique with us. And it's really great to see uh, machine learning in action. I know that's a trending scary topic for a lot of people. So I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Any questions for Jaya will be at the end. Um, if she's still with us, I know it is in the middle of the night for you. So, <laughs> Okay, so fantastic. We are on to our last presenter, Rachel Passer. So Rachel, is a GIS manager in state government working with big data, health and demographics programs, and web applications. So feel free to start sharing your screen, Rachel, and kick us off. Excellent. Thank you for having me today. Let me try and share my screen. 
So I'm just going, I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm going to show you um, my agency's website and kind of walk you through what it looks like while telling you a bit about the big data workflows that I'm going through. So as Madison said, my name is Rachel Passer. Um, I'm a GIS manager in state government. I work at an agency called Revenue and Fiscal Affairs. And um, I have kind of a unique role that's been playing out interestingly. I've been there about a year and a half. So when I say establishing workflows, that's really the crux of it right now. I'm trying to wrangle all these different projects that are going on, and uh, standardize them, convert them from ArcMap to ArcGIS Pro with the hope of eventually automating things. So I'm on a GIS team and it's interesting because my boss is South Carolina's state GIS coordinator, Adam DeMars. So while some of my role is to support Adam, I also serve as the technical lead of the agency's GIS team. So this entails enterprise administration, web application development, developing geocoding services, but additionally, where big data especially comes into play for me is that in my role, I specifically support other divisions of RFA, such as our state's data warehouse. So I'll tab over to that. Uh, well, this is the state coordinator stuff. Hold on. Little menu is getting in the way. Okay, there it is. Data services. So this part of RFA is interesting because they store a huge amount of protected information for South Carolina. Much of it is PHI or protected health information, HIPAA protected stuff. So I'm hired to do all of the GIS and cartography for the data warehouse as part of my agency. So this role, it has me leveraging geospatial big data for data warehouse projects, as well as some political data reporting outside of the data warehouse that I also do for the GIS team. So when it comes to working with big data, you know, you can see on this website that mapping services is one component. So in this role, I work alongside uh, programmers, our IT staff. I work with a team of statisticians that do SAS programming. And in order to support their work with GIS, um, I have my own page basically on the website that's called analytics mapping. So this part of our agency, you can hire them to do research for you. They charge $110 an hour pretty much. So, you know, like I can do GIS for customers through this aspect of my role. And this is a general overview of what it entails with some maps on the side. So, you know, we're talking about data integration, which means like linking data sets from SAS or SQL to spatial data in ArcGIS. And I also um, prepare a lot of data that we host on REST services. Um, we do a lot of geocoding. That's something everybody on my team does, but I do a lot of it. Um, network analysis, spatial statistics and analysis, health and demographics, and cartography. And um, more specifically, since we're talking about big data today, um, I wanted to get into like, in this aspect of my role, what that looks like in government. So when I'm doing any sort of analysis with big data, it's typically coming to me either from an external source, so maybe through an FTP server that gives me a flat file, or it's coming to me from another team internally, maybe from SAS. So all of these things end up going into SQL most of the time. So I've had to quickly learn to get more and more comfortable using SQL, SQL Server Management Studio, and setting that up to connect with ArcGIS Pro. So Often what happens is either I get a flat file, like a text file or a CSV, and I do some ETL stuff in SQL to bring in a big table and, you know, delimit and all that stuff. Or it's already in SQL from another team and it's like a really large table. And um, then I'm either doing geocoding of some sort or network analysis. So it's interesting because I mentioned earlier, we do a ton of geocoding at this agency on our team. This is because with the data warehouse, they're getting a lot of research requests and they don't just come from South Carolina. It could be some study from Harvard where South Carolina's foster care population is one cohort amongst other states. 
And so they hired South Carolina's data warehouse to do that component. And if that study needed some sort of spatial information, it would go to me. So what that ends up looking like is perhaps a SAS programmer drops a table in SQL, and then I'm bringing it into ArcGIS Pro. Typically, I'm geocoding it. So if I'm geocoding a table and I know that there are records outside of South Carolina, then I'm going to be using StreetMap Premium, which my agency purchases for me to use. So that covers all of North America. So I'll either do that or sometimes I do some geocoding work that is not necessarily for the data warehouse, but maybe for like our state's election commission. So it'll be voter data, that kind of stuff. And when I work with that, those types of jobs are, they have MOAs or MOUs in place for how we do them. And they require us to use an in-house address locator. So I also build an address locator that we use for the state of South Carolina. And also because my boss is the state coordinator, he distributes this locator to all of the agencies that are a member of the council he supports. So I'm building address locators with statewide address point and road center line data sets we receive and mosaic together and then build into locators. Then I geocode and then we get the results. And often if it's, even if it's political stuff for my GIS team or it's geocoding work for the data warehouse, the theme that keeps emerging is after things are geocoded, we're spatial joining some sort of information to it cleaning up the table and providing it out either into smaller reports or it's going into a table that is going back to a statistician to finish the invoice like things like that so that's often what i'm doing there are some um, workflows through the data warehouse having me do network analysis and when that happens i'm usually receiving a file similar to geocoding in sql and it'll be like they want to measure distance and drive time between patient and provider, but they already know the combinations. So I look at the network analyst tools and I know that OD cost matrix doesn't work because it's looking for the nearest. So I had to do some research up front when I started this job, like what is the best way to do network analysis of known pairs on a large data set? Because before I knew to use the root tool, but that's not really meant for large data. So I found that Esri on their GitHub page, they have some um, open source, not open source, they have some tools on their GitHub page that are Python scripts that do known OD. So I found that and I got that up and running. And again, when I do network analysis, I'm using StreetMap Premium's network data set. It's called Rooting ND if you have uh, StreetMap Premium. So that's something I do with big data sets, measuring distance and drive time between point A and point B, but for two very large files. And then I do the measurements and then ultimately what goes back to the customer is just a table that happens to have two extra fields for distance and drive time. You know, with all of the GIS work that I'm doing under the hood, to me, it's funny that what just goes back to them is a table with two new fields, but you know, that's part of it. But when I do those kinds of jobs, um, I have to track time and effort. I have to build hours. I have to think about how do you calculate time when you're doing things that have certain amounts of records, even if they run quickly, you know, like, so in my new role, I'm, I'm starting to think about the business side of things. Once you scale up in terms of size of tables. Um, so other than that, um, there are other specific things that I have to keep in mind as I grow into this role, but some of the lessons that I've learned are you got to learn your organization's ETL processes. So when I came in, I saw that sometimes we were taking flat files and just using Microsoft Access to bring them into ArcGIS or ArcMap. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> how do I get this in SQL? This needs to be faster. So, you know, it's a process of like, how do I get a SQL database for myself? Like I have to go through someone outside my team. So it's a lot of like poking around, like who can help me? And I've found that once I got like ETL down, I had to spread it to my team and be like, now we're doing things this way. Um, I have found that if I'm asked to use data in a particular way, I try to stick to the plan as much as possible because even though there's large data sets, 
that you want to use in an efficient way. Sometimes there are data usage agreements or MOUs, or you have to be very careful because you're working with PHI or PII. For example, I do this one workflow for, it's for our state election commission, but we receive DMV records, everybody in the DMV on an annual basis. And since it contains things like date of birth and social security numbers, it's locked down on a very secure SQL server that I get time limited access to behind a firewall. I get in there, I do my geocoding and spatial joins, and then I drop it back in SQL. And then it goes to a SQL programmer that takes it from there. So I have to be very, very careful in order to just do things that even though the GIS work itself seems straightforward, everything's a little less straightforward when you're working with big secure data. So yeah, um, when you know that you have to do certain sets of steps with big data sets, what I have found is I like to test a method or a step on a large data set by extracting a small sample first, just to make sure that it works, to get a feel for how long the tool will take. And then from there, I will, I'll extrapolate to kind of plan my time management and stuff. So at this point, you know, I've learned that on a 4 million record file in ArcGIS Pro, if I need to do a spatial join after the fact, it's going to take about 30 minutes. So I have to plan around that. Eventually, I will get to automating these things, but I'm still like first or second time through a workflow. So that's just generally been a challenge, like learning all the different things going on, finding the common themes. You know, I, I inherited a, a setup with no documentation. Um, we didn't have a GIS team until a few months after I started. They re, they've been restructuring my agency. <laughs> So it's been a wild goose chase of learning the different workflows, putting them together, finding the common themes, and then deduplicating efforts, documenting, and automating. So right now, as I give this talk, I'm just in the middle of it, like writing things down as I learn with the hopes that in the next few years, you know, things will get scripted or modeled. And right now I'm just like, let's make sure we do it the correct, modern, validated way. So I am excited to see where this goes. I think it's really cool. I love all the different types of things I get to do, but yeah, I've got my work cut out for me. But if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to me at rachel.passer at rfa.sc.gov. You can also email analytics mapping and that will go to me or just mapping at rfa.sc.gov, which goes to my entire team. But yeah, I would love to talk about, you know, health demographics, large data, and making everything more efficient. I'm just on the path. <laughs> but, you know, thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing your path with us. It sounds like you inherited a lot, and it sounds like you're uh, really figuring it out. That's, that's great to hear. Um, I, under, I understand how difficult it can be when you're trying to basically start from scratch, even if workflows are established when there's no documentation, it feels like you're starting from scratch anyway. So I appreciate the advice that you shared in that regard. Uh, well, this leaves us with the Q&A portion of our Lightning Talk series. So for this, um, if anyone has any questions, they can drop them in the chat or they can unmute themselves and just feel free to ask our presenters directly. At this exact moment, I do not see any questions in the chat, so I'm going to the first one. Uh, my first question is actually directed to any of our presenters to ask. It's a pretty uh, general question. So whoever comes up with an answer first, feel free to unmute and go ahead and take, take on that first run. Um, we've talked a lot about some pretty advanced techniques for dealing with geospatial big data. Um, if, if you encountered someone who had never worked with ge big geospatial data before, how would you recommend getting started as like a step one, whether it's a certain technology they should start with or um, a, certain, um, a certain kind of tutorial process that you know of? Uh, what would you tell someone who had no idea where to even begin? I can put something out there. I would say my first gut feeling is, is there a data dictionary? Is there any documentation on the table? Just stare at it and look at the fields, 
query, you know, query the table, try to get a feel for the patterns, like, and yeah, if there's a data dictionary, read through it and start understanding what you're looking at. Thank you, Rachel. Do any of our other speakers have feedback? Yeah, so um, if it is a new data set, I would just like typically try to find a technology that I can work with. Um, so be it say Google Earth Engine or QGIS. So some of the open source tools, because I mean, I work at a university, so open source tools are something that we sort of uh, seek uh, as a first cut. And uh, most times, I mean, as a computer scientist, I uh, tend to also put the hat of a computer scientist and think of like algorithms that I can use for many of the data sets based on the data type and uh, the domain, right? Uh, I mean, this is geospatial, but the problem statement as well, right? So if it is healthcare, there will be something, some standards related to um, healthcare data and things like that, which will also need to be mapped in the and then the geospatial data has to be extracted and then worked with so uh, my first cut is to look at technologies that would work with the data type and the domain thank you jaya yeah that's really good advice to um, check for compatible technologies and also to review standards that is a really good point when working with new data uh, i actually i don't see any questions in the chat right now so i have another question specifically for hamble and emma um, when y'all were talking about um, GeoParquet and all the associated uh, libraries that go into working with it, um, there was a lot of coding, a lot of different coding languages brought up. And I know coding scares a lot of people. I know, Emma, you specifically mentioned binary is scary, not that people code in binary anymore, but the abstractions of it alone can still be very scary to people. Uh, well, you know, what kind of, there's a bunch of languages to start with, um, but what do you think if someone who had never coded before and they wanted to start using these technologies uh, you were talking about, what is a good language to get started with? I think Emma and I probably can provide different yeah. like insights, like because I think my way to GIS was kind of unique. Maybe not unique, maybe I think I am a little unique, but maybe many people got in this way. I just like making things with like, especially on the browser. So I started with a, like a JavaScript and I kind of got drawn into like the geospatial data because it's inherently visual. And then it also has a lot of potential for its social impact. So like a lot of combination just naturally drew me into it. So if you're kind of a doer and a kind of person who feels like satisfied, like by seeing the results right away. And if you have a very specific project in your mind to build, I do want to recommend JavaScript. And, but I mean, I think if, but if you're more of like a data analyst type of a person, you want to delve, delve deep into it. You want to find something out of it, or you want to make some scientific results out of it. Maybe it is the, the language is not ready yet. The language has a lot of potential. So may, I think the Python is usually the languages that is recommended for like a more data science analyst type of people. Do you have different opinion, Emma? <laughs> uh, I don't think so, actually. Uh, I think, you know, I, I came into GIS also from a, an ArcGIS background. Um, uh, because that's what that's what was used in uh, in academia and uh, yeah so Python was my first language and it was yeah I, I agree with your sense of like it depends on what kind of uh, preferences you have right like I came into Python and fell in love with programming because I could do things uh, that would ordinarily have taken a lot longer uh, manually um, so there's that sense of uh, power I think with um, with something like Python. Um, but I agree with Hanvil on the visualization power of JavaScript and web mapping. And I'll actually go back and kind of also answer the first question because I thought it was really interesting. Um, and, and I think, you know, Hanvil, you do this too. Like, I think for for all of us to some extent, we're we're in data and we're in a field that kind of feeds our curiosity. And I think there's this really cool thing about 
where we live uh, and all the open data uh, websites that are out there, right? Just like the one that, um, uh, that I forgot the last presenter's name, I'm sorry, uh, Rachel, uh, that you presented uh, about, and I'm in Charleston, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna preach about uh, City of Charleston, um, a great GIS uh, open data portal. And it's a really easy way that anyone can get into uh, and look at a map of local data and look at the records, but also look at the map, right? And start to ask questions. And then and then from there, like you can easily download the data. And then if it's really, you know, if it's dense data and if you wanna get creative and push yourself to, to see it on the web, I think that's where like, you can really take things up a notch, right? And go into things like GeoPark A, like what we showed. Um, you know, and that's, that might feel like it's way down the line, but that's kind of, I mean, that's the rabbit hole that we're in <laughs> for, and I think that's a good thing. I love that you called it the rabbit hole we're in because it really does feel like that, you know, if you decide on a language to get started with by a certain category, depending on visualization or data analysis or whatever your task is, uh, there's a million different branches you can go down. And, you know, one of those branches ends up having Geopark A or other ones never touch it. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that insight there. Uh, it actually looks like we have a question from the audience. Anissa has raised your hand, so feel free to unmute yourself and go ask away. Hi, everyone. Um, can you all hear me? I was having some issues with the micro. So, okay, <laughs> yes, I, bought a mic. I bought a mic yesterday. Should... Um, thank you so much for to the presenter. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm fairly new to GIS, so this is my first talk. That's me. Um, oh, it looks yeah. like we're losing you a little bit there. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? I think if you, yeah, if you talk at a steady volume, but whenever you stop, it cuts out a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm I'm a little, I'm kind of new to GIS. I'm about six years in, and I was working as a epidemiologist the last few years, and that's really where I got exposed to GIS. So we were mapping COVID infection rates, and then I was doing opioid um, fatalities, non-fatal overdoses, um, so a lot of like health data, um, and so I really got exposed to GIS there, and now I really want to hyper focus into GIS and kind of, you know, learn as much as I can and myself to trees. Um, so I guess my question was, you know, what are kind of like the top skills um, that people are looking for, and I think you y'all kind of answered it for, you know, as I, I raised my hand a while ago, so I think you're answering the question as I was sitting here. Um, so yeah, I mean, we would do things like bivariate analysis and geocode and, you know, um, survey one, two, three, like just things like that. So I don't know if those are like too basic or I don't know, listening to everybody or talking about big data and data science. Sometimes I feel really like overwhelmed and kind of intimidated by the fact that I don't Maybe I don't know too much right now, and I don't know. So um, it's just like, how do you get your foot in the door um, to where you're, you know, you look good on paper for getting a job and as a full-time GIS analyst, because I'm essentially doing a career shift. Um, yeah, so I guess that's my question. I don't know if I'm kind of rambling now, but that, I guess that's what. No, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, presenters, any any insight on that? I can take a stab at some of that because I come from a very similar background. Like I used to work at a research institute alongside uh, epidemiologists and programmers, and I was like just a GIS analyst. But what I would say is if you want to get deeper into the geospatial side of things and just all things GIS, um, once you get your foot in the door somewhere, just pick up as much as you can and learn your environment. So like at my last job, I came in just knowing ArcMap. And over time, I picked up skills with SAS, R. I used Adobe Creative Cloud, and I ended up using SQL Server because those were the technologies being used around me. And I just realized that I couldn't go past a certain boundary unless I pushed to also start using the technologies adjacent to me. So that was really based on what my employer used. But 
as I continued into my current role at RFA, they're very similar to my old job at the university in that they also do a lot of SAS and SQL and R and Python. So I'm like, okay, I'm just learning that around me, the people I have to work with that don't do GIS, that give me data, are using these technologies. And how can I translate GIS to them so we can work together? And what I've found is like, just SQL, honestly, for me right now, like that is what people outside my team understand and within my team understand. <laughs> so it's like, that's kind of the equalizer, even if it's not the best thing in general, like amongst all the other presenters. In my situation, I'm like, if I need to talk about data and make sure people that don't do GIS know what I'm talking about, put in a SQL database and just say, look at the table, you know? So it, I would just say, learn your environment and figure out how to translate like with your words like how to talk about it if you have an epidemiology background you know i would wonder what technologies you use and what you're trying to do in gis and try to find the language in gis for what you know with your epi background so i'm just coming in from it from the other direction i guess sure thank you yeah we were just using arcade so i have to basic arcade knowledge but then so when you learn python and sql are a lot of these languages, like if you know one can you pick up the other i mean i, I think that kind of depends like sql is pretty different from python sql is all about like databases and i you know since this is a talk about big data you know like you can store a lot of big data in sql and you know there's a lot of really cool progressive new types of technologies available, but, you know, like I'm in government. So, you know, I think it's going to be very common in a government public sector environment to see something more like SQL. So, you know, it's kind of a balance between moving forward and doing the most innovative stuff and just realistically, what are you going to find in a public sector data analyst position? So SQL is different from Python. I think Python and R would be a little more similar. I, I think that's what I've heard and learned. Like I've, I've done some R and Python and I think it's kind of a similar vibe. It's just Python's built into GIS, whereas R is not so much. So th does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for your question, Anifa. It uh, looks like we have time for one more question. I, there's one in the chat from Rinda. Uh, it seems like it's directed a little bit towards Campbell and Emma. Uh, Rinda says, I haven't heard of GeoParquet before. Uh, so apologies if this is basic, but does the GeoParquet format work for non-shapefile spatial data, uh, rasters, remote sensing imagery, et cetera? Like one day, could I more easily export a high resolution TIFF from Google Earth Engine without it producing a million tiles? This question can be another on our talk, but <laughs> the short answer, uh, no, GeoPark is for vector data, so it's not really for raster data, but there is also a lot of exciting new technologies going on with the uh, raster data. Actually, Emma, do you want to take a step on it? I'm pretty sure you're, yeah. More it. I, yeah. I I don't know about that. Um, I was I was already hopping uh, onto the the single the difference between SQL and like single file storage formats. Um, but yeah, uh, I think what Hanbyo was going to mention uh, was cloud optimized uh, geotiffs. Um, uh, so that would be the ra uh, not a raster equivalent to GeoParquet, but there there are other formats to handle raster data uh, efficiently. And, uh, you know, I, I think even the tiling approach that uh, Hanbiel talked about, right, like that's that's just in terms of, of how to handle raster data, right, the, the tiling methodology of, um, of cutting things up and only showing what you need to see at the resolution of which at which you're seeing it, right? Um, so that's the premise behind uh, something like cloud optimized geotiffs where uh, the the, there's metadata about the data in the file storage, um, so that it's it's more efficient than traditional um, traditional raster data. Yeah, it sounds like maybe we need to come back. Uh, <laughs> we need another lightning talk for sure. 
we definitely need a whole nother lightning talk on cloud optimized format. Well, uh, that that's the end of our Q&A, guys. We've run out of time. I wish I could keep you here all day, uh, but I can't. So thank you so much for spending an hour of your day with us. Thank you so much, presenters, for presenting. Please come back. We, we'd love to have you, and we'd love to hear more. We, we'd love more lightning talks, more information. Invite your friends. Always, always a great time. Uh, next, next month, our topic is the Internet of Things, another very wide-ranging topic. Um, so feel free to join us again on the first Friday of March at noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern, and about 1.30 in the morning, I think, in India. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, the recordings will be posted on our YouTube channel as soon as possible. So be sure to give that a look and share on social media. Thank you so much again, everyone, for coming.